Chatham House Distinguished Fellow, Professor David Hayman. Uh, today we're exploring how Japan has approached the pandemic. Um, it's widely considered among international experts to have been fairly successful uh, with quite a low number of deaths. That's uh, 2,139 when I checked yesterday. Um, despite having one of the world's oldest populations and densely packed cities, and while not locking down hard and taking a rather unorthodox approach to two of the key pillars of epidemic control, testing and contact tracing. Um, with us today to discuss this is one of the architects of Japan's coronavirus strategy, Hitoshi Oshitani. Uh, Hitoshi is a professor of virology at Tohoku University in Japan, and he sits on several of the expert advisory groups guiding the Japanese response. Um, he's credited with massive contributions to the knowledge of how the virus is transmitted and for pushing the urgency early on and constantly pestering the government to do more. And he's become a global ambassador for the so-called uh, Japan model. So it's very exciting to have him with us here today. Uh, but before we start, I just want to remind you that you can ask questions using the Q&A function. Upvoted questions are more likely to be selected. So if you like one of those, do upvote it. Briefings on the record, and the recording should be available shortly after on this um, on the pandemic briefing playlist on Chatham House's YouTube channel. So um, Hitoshi, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Emma, thank you very much for inviting me for this webinar. And um, it's my great pleasure to be at the seminar to share our experience in Japan. Great. Well, I, I, I'm sure we have a lot, lot to learn. There's so much um, you've done in a very innovative way. Um, I, I was hoping you could start by giving us a brief overview of Japan's experience uh, to date with the pandemic and what the Japan model is, um, how restricted has everyday life been for the Japanese and, and what you've learned from your experience with the virus and the strategy you've taken to tackle it. Okay, so I will briefly explain what uh, we've been doing in Japan. Uh, the first, uh, let me briefly summarize uh, what has been happening in Japan for the COVID-19. The, the very first case was uh, identified on the January 15th the, the, in the traveler from China. And uh, then in, in early February, the, we had the, at, um, the Diamond Princess, the, the issue in Japan, the, at the Yokohama Bay. And um, then, the, from February 13th, the, we suddenly saw the, the locally acquired cases. And the Minister of Health, the Labor and the Welfare, they set up a cluster task force on 25th of uh, February. The Professor Hiroshi Nishura, the, who is now the professor at Kyoto University, and uh, I the joined this team. and. Uh, the, the Hiroshi's uh, the team had uh, the preliminary data, uh, which suggested that uh, the majority of infected individual actually uh, did not pass the virus to anybody else. And the small proportion of infected the person the infected many others. And um, that was uh, our early finding from uh, the epidemiological investigation of the locally acquired cases. And um, then the, we realized that uh, the, the, for COVID-19, the transmission cannot be sustained without forming the large clusters or super spreading events uh, in which the one person the, infect many others. And that's why the, we've been focusing on the cluster. So the, our, cluster, the, our strategy is basically the cluster-based approach. And, but, and then the, from... Uh, the mid March, the, we saw the increasing number of cases that due to imported cases from many different countries, including European countries, the US, Southeast Asian countries and others. And then the, the government decided to declare a state of emergency on 4th of, uh, 7th of April. But uh, even during a state of emergency, the, the, we did not implement lockdown type of measure that we just ask people to stay at home as much as possible. And uh, we also ask people to the, the not travel the, the between the, 
the prefectures. And uh, we also asked some uh, restaurants and the shops to be closed, but the, all these measures are on voluntary basis. And uh, our legal system the, does not allow us to implement the, any measure with uh, the enforcement power. So the, even the, during the, the state of emergency, we did not implement any measure with the, the enforcement power. And but the, 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 in general, the people, the, the follow the, the government and the expert advice and the number of cases decreased the, by mid-May. And uh, we continue to do our cluster-based approach and uh, to find the cluster. And uh, or then the, at the end of the June or the mid-June, the, we started again increasing number of cases. And uh, the, this, the, the phase was mainly due to the, the, the many clusters in the large the nightlife entertainment areas in Tokyo and some other big cities. But uh, the, we the still try to have a dialogue with uh, the people working there and also customers the, in the night, the life entertainment areas. And um, then we managed to suppress the transmission, the level, and uh, by mid-August, the, the, our daily number that went down to the few hundred per day. And then the now we are seeing some increasing trend the, the, due to several reasons. And uh, we are seeing the clusters in the different settings, not only in nightlife entertainment areas, but uh, also in uh, small restaurants, uh, and the bars and uh, the sports event and so on. And uh, the, the current phase is much more complicated. And uh, as uh, in the many the other Northern Hemisphere countries, the, we are going into this, the winter and uh, the particularly we are seeing the, the, the increasing trend in the Northern part of Japan, particularly in Hokkaido and also in some other places like Osaka and Tokyo. So we are now facing the, the new challenge, but um, the, especially the, under such the situation, the, it's getting the more difficult to do the, the proper contact tracing. The, we, uh, we are doing uh, the, we are also doing the quite unique approach for contact tracing. And in addition to the usual prospective contact tracing the, to, the, we are also the, we've been doing the retro, so-called retrospective or backward, the contact tracing to identify the source of infection. The, because uh, the, the, when you have uh, epidemiologically unlinked cases, there must be the, the source of infection, which is likely to be a cluster. So we've been trying to find the clusters the, from the, the epidemiologically unlinked cases uh, by uh, identify the common source of infection. And uh, well, that's uh, what we've been doing. And uh, as I mentioned, we are facing the new, new challenge at the moment, but uh, the, we've been discussing how to the, 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 the respond to the current situation. And um, so that's uh, the brief overview of what we've been doing in Japan. Thank, thank you, Hitoshi. I, I wanted to dig down a bit deeper into um, this cluster-based uh, based approach. Um, more, more about how you go about this. Um, we've heard others talk about you have an army of cluster busters. And um, so how do you go about what is, what is the system for identifying first what the cluster is and then what you do once you've ident identified it? Who's involved in this? Um, have you hired contractors? Do you use an in, um, already existing workforce for this? Um, and, and why did you focus on this uh, particularly? This seems to be a, a big cornerstone of, 
of um, why you've put so much energy and how much do you attribute um, your uh, response success to this cluster-based approach? So the first of all, uh, we've been focusing on cluster uh, the because uh, as I mentioned, the without forming cluster, the, the COVID-19 transmission cannot be sustained. And uh, the, the particularly dangerous situation is uh, the, where the, the cluster to cluster transmission they occur. So we have to interrupt the, the such cluster to cluster transmission. And uh, the, to do so, we need to identify the cluster as many as possible. And um, so when we have uh, some cases that we try to identify the, the source of infection, and that uh, this has been done by the public health nurses in Japan, that we have over 400 public health centers and uh, over 8,000 public health nurses are working in these public health centers. And they are the ones that who are doing the, the contact tracing, both retrospective and prospective contact tracing. And um, they are trained the, for public health, the, in addition to the usual, the, the nursing, the curriculum. And um, also they have been doing uh, the contact tracing the, even before COVID-19 for measles, the tuberculosis, and the other the infectious diseases. And they are the well experienced on the contact tracing. And the, even before we proposed the, the cluster-based approach, the, the public health nurses actually already did the retrospective contact tracing to identify the, the source of infection. And um, the prospective contact tracing, the, the particular for COVID-19 is the not so effective. The positive rate is quite low among close contact. But they, if you find the, the common source and uh, the, the, if that is a cluster, the, you can find many positive cases the, among the, the cluster, uh, among the people the, who are in the cluster. So the, the, our approach, the, we were, we've been focusing more on the retrospective, the, the contact tracing to identify the source of infection. But uh, this is uh, the this has been done the, based on the mutual trust between the public health nurses and the infected the, the people, and uh, this is particularly difficult for the cluster the in the nightlife entertainment settings. The people the the some people do not want to tell the truth to public health nurses. But the public health nurses have been trying to the, build the trust the, with uh, the, the infected people to get the, their the, the past activities in the past uh, the one or two weeks. And uh, that's the, how we've been doing our the cluster-based approach, including uh, the retrospect contact tracing. But are these public health nurses, do they already know the constituents in their the community members or and are they how are they doing it are they phoning people is there an app are they knocking on the door uh, how are they physically making contact with people in the cluster and tracking this all down so the for particularly for the retrospective ones the we have to interview the uh, confirmed cases so the, the most of the confirmed cases are either in hospital or designated the isolation facilities. And uh, the public health nurses sometimes visit uh, these uh, the places the, or the, they, they phone the, 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 these uh, individuals to get the details the, the, about their the, the past activities, especially the activities related to the, the uh, the, the risky environment. Okay. Um, David, I wanted to ask you on this, and what are your thoughts on the role of uh, retrospective contact tracing as opposed to a sole focus 
on the prospective contract tracing. So that is <clears throat> tracing forward who people might have infected once you've identified a case. Can this be replicated in other countries and, and should it be? And I'm wondering, could this be why some countries are finding it difficult to stay on top of this? Hitoshi said prospective contact tracing is very difficult to do. Um, or is it that they're using their network of public health nurses to do it? I'm, I'm just wondering how generalizable this might be for others and is there anything we can learn from this or apply? Well, clearly what uh, Hitoshi has talked about is good public health and good outbreak control, investigation and decisions on what needs to be done. So the, the retrospective identification of sources of infection is extremely important in all outbreaks. And, and therefore, by shutting that down somehow, you can prevent further clusters, which is what Hitoshi has said. I think what's, what's been important in Japan is that Japan actually was the first country to show that this does not transmit in the way that does influenza. It does stop off in clusters before it goes into communities. And if you can find those clusters, which are really the Achilles heel of outbreaks, you can stop transmission as has been done in um, Japan. Other countries have done it. They've done it in different ways. They call it different things. But many countries in Asia, and Hitoshi will agree with me, I'm sure, such as Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, have been trying to investigate their outbreaks and trying to shut down the areas of transmission, some of them by a blunt lockdown of nightclubs for a week. Right now, I believe Hong Kong has their nightlife shut down for a couple of weeks while they're waiting to see if they can decrease transmission that was occurring there. So these have been ways that Asian countries and Japan in particular have conserved their economies to the best possible way that they could do during a pandemic, while at the same time making sure that the efforts that they're making are effective. And, and they've used local workers to do that because that's where trust occurs. As Hitoshi said, you can't do contact tracing um, by an app or by something which nobody has face-to-face -face contact with or trust with. They have to have trust in the investigators. And there are in every country, there are investigators that look at TB, as Hitoshi said, they look at, at many different infections, HIV, trying to help identify contacts and decrease spread. So the, the J Japanese have just used incredibly wise ways of dealing with this outbreak by understanding early that it doesn't just go directly into communities when it enters a country, it stops off in clusters. Germany began that technique in Europe and has continued that. They have many um, what they call cluster, uh, COVID um, workers who are, are medical students and others who are doing the job in Germany and many other countries. The UK started it as well, but the UK felt overwhelmed in their contact tracing and they stopped it during their blunt lockdowns. And now they're starting to do it again in areas where there are discrete clusters because they know that that's the way you can really shut down transmission. But, but David, do you think that there needs to be, or there is some wisdom feasibility in reorienting contact tracing you know, across the board in several other countries towards a more retrospective way that Hitoshi is describing. I'm talking about the emphasis of the, what, how much energy you put into forward versus reverse. Do, do you think there might be some wisdom in reorienting the system and is it even possible to do that? Well, absolutely. Um, what Hitoshi described is outbreak investigation, which all epidemiologists and all public health people do to find the source of infection. And Japan has done it particularly well. I think as countries come out of this feeling that they're overwhelmed with cases and go to areas where transmission is occurring still in clusters, and that's many parts of the world, of the countries, including probably right here in London where there are clusters of outbreaks, if they can find them and shut down the areas where there's transmission, they don't have to do these blunt lockdowns that countries have been doing to try to decrease transmission. They can do it in a surgical precise way instead of a long way. And you know, Emma, um, after the blunt lockdowns in Europe, and Hitoshi may want to comment on this, but after the blunt lockdowns in Europe, which ended in May and June, countries just opened up from one day to the next. And so nothing was maintained as areas of risk for transmission and 
continued to be shut down, everything was wide open again and transmission began to occur within countries and also as people went on holiday to other countries. And so this transmission is what resulted in the resurgence which occurred in the autumn months, amplified by the fact that people are more indoors during the cooler weather and able to transmit more um, easily from person to person. So maybe Hitoshi would wanna comment on, on that, whether or not he feels that these precise lockdowns are the way to go in the future in all countries. Uh, yes, sure. The, as I mentioned, uh, we did not uh, the implement lockdown measure in Japan. Uh, instead, uh, we've been focusing on the, the, the risky the environment the, where the most of uh, the, the clusters are occurring. The, actually, the, the cluster have been occurring in different settings. The, depending on the stage of uh, the outbreak. In the February, the March, April, the, we've been seeing uh, many clusters associated with uh, the middle age or elderly people the, the, in the sports gym or some other settings. But the, then the, in the June, July, we saw many clusters in uh, the, the, the large night, Life entertainment areas, and in current the the phase, the we've been seeing the clusters in a different the the settings, not only in nightlife entertainment areas, but also in a small restaurants and uh, the the foreigners communities and so on. So the 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 setting where the clusters are occurring are changing. So the. It's important to know the in which settings the clusters are occurring, the, so that uh, the, we can the, the put the the more emphasis on uh, the the situation of where the clusters are occurring. And but are also, you shutting down those environments? The, in some cases, but uh, the the at the moment the some the local government some prefectures the 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 ask the the bars and restaurant to be closed at the 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. Not total shutdown. The, in some areas, in some very small areas, the they ask to the, the close some restaurants and the bars at the night. But uh, we've been trying to minimize the 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 social and economic impact by implementing these measures. And from the beginning. The, our objective of the COVID-19 response is uh, to the, minimize the, the level of transmission as much as possible while maintaining the, the social and economic activities. So the, we've been trying to balance between uh, uh, these uh, two difficult ones, the, the balancing the, the suppression of the, the virus and uh, the maintaining the social and economic activity is quite challenging. And uh, we are also, been discussing in the past few days uh, the, the what we should do the, the under current situation. Okay, th th thank you for that. I wanted to come back to super spreading event. Um, maybe David, what H Hitoshi was describing um, where you know three quarters of the cases they found in these clusters did not go on to infect anybody else, but there was a minority that went on to infect loads of people. Um, seems to me that there are super spreaders as opposed to a super spreading event. There's always been a lot of discussion to be careful to distinguish between, we're not talking about super spreaders, we're talking about super spreading events. This seems to me that there are in fact super spreaders. Am I reading that wrong? What I believe you're seeing is that there are some people who, are, who respond differently to the virus than others and they have a higher level of virus in their blood, in their nasal passage, and in places where they can transmit it. And so they're the people that transmit, whereas people who remain asymptomatic or don't develop a high virus level uh, don't transmit. It's, it's basic understanding that higher virus levels in the body cause greater transmission to others. And that's through coughing, through sneezing, through speaking, through singing, through various measures. 
And we know that people just before they develop signs and symptoms are able to transmit. Whereas people who don't develop signs and symptoms throughout their infection are at a lower risk of transmitting to others. This has been shown in many places. In Singapore, they understand that about 7% of people who develop symptoms can transmit within the two days prior to uh, transmission, but they don't see that transmission occurring in, in others. And so, you know, this disease is very unusual because there are so many asymptomatic or, or non-symptomatic infections, but some of them can be transmitting. And what transmits even more are those people who you're calling super spreaders, who have a higher titer virus because at which then results in disease in them rather than in signs and symptoms, rather than just an infection. So yes, these are super spreading events caused by people who have higher virus titers, but they, to call them super spreaders gives the impression that they're attempting to spread it and they're not attempting to spread it. It's just the fact that they have a higher virus titer for some reason or other. So really, if we're being honest, there are super spreaders, but it doesn't mean they're doing it on purpose. Hitoshi, what do you call people who spread uh, disease easier? You call them yeah. super spreaders. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of yes. the super spreader, but the, the, actually the super spreading event can occur the, due to different reasons. As the David mentioned, uh, the, some people uh, probably the shedding a large amount of viruses. But uh, the, 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 that kind of host factor uh, is probably the, quite important, but uh, not just host factor, but also the, the environment and the social factors are involved in the super spreading event. And uh, we analyzed the many the clusters and we found that uh, the many of these super spreaders that are relatively young in 20s and 30s. And uh, that's probably because they are more active in uh, the, their social life. And uh, also we found that uh, the more than 40% of uh, these super spreading events are caused by the, the person in pre-symptomatic phase. And uh, they, that is the, the probably because uh, they are still the very fit uh, they do not have any the, the, the symptoms. That's why that they are they're going to the sports gym, the live music event, and uh, the drinking places and so on. And uh, that's the, the, how the, these super spreading events are occurring. Okay. You know, Emma, I might just add to that. Um, in fact, there was a, an event in Germany, which was when they really realized that they needed to start contact tracing, which was just what Hitoshi described. It was a woman who had come in uh, with infection and was meeting in a small enclosed space with two or three, up to five people. And she was pre-symptomatic. She developed symptoms two days later when she got home. But she was transmitting during that period of time to these people who were in this very closed environment. So what Hitoshi says is right. Super spreading events are the environment and the host both. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna move on from those. I get it now. Um, what, one thing, uh, Hitoshi, that, that you said that is very interesting for us is that um, Japan does not have any authority or legislation in place to enforce this. It's all voluntary. You've got a lot of people in Japan um, densely packed. How were you able to get the community buy-in and compliance? I mean, the numbers, your death rate is, is low. To what do you attribute the fact that without enforcement or threat of anything, you've been managed to get the community on board, if, if you feel you have? The, I believe that the number of factors uh, involved in uh, the, the Japanese situation, the, the, the first of all, the, the, especially the, during the, the state of emergency period, the people followed the, the government advice, the, the including the stay at home, the, the message, and also the most of uh, the, the, the restaurants are closed uh, at the night. 
and uh, even without any enforcement power. And uh, now the majority of people are wearing masks uh, in the public places. And uh, if you uh, take subway in the Tokyo, uh, probably 90, more than 99% of the people that are wearing masks. And uh, this is uh, the, because uh, uh, we have a very strong peer pressure in the Japanese society. Uh, if you don't follow the, the, the general rules, the, uh, you are the highly criticized. And, um, but the, the negative side of, uh, so this is uh, the one of the main reason why the people followed the, 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 our advice, but uh, the negative side of this is uh, uh, discrimination the, the type of thing. And uh, so we've been seeing the such things uh, the, in the different places of Japan. So the, the, probably because of the, the high peer pressure, that if you do not the follow the, the some the, the advice, that you are the highly criticized. And even the infected people are the discriminated, the, in some the, the the places, so that's the, the probably the negative side of the Japanese uh, the, the the response. But, okay, um, yeah, that is a double-edged sword, I suppose. Um, uh, David, maybe uh, I wanted to ask you about what Hitoshi was saying that um, isolation is done in isolation facilities. Um, and do you think this could be uh, a major driver of keeping numbers low? I remember when we had Mike Ryan on, he had said that the, the quarantining and isolation, if you don't actually isolate and quarantine and stay away from others, you're not going to interrupt transmission. And that's probably the single biggest thing that is not happening optimally. I guess if in Japan they are taking people out of the community and putting them in isolation facilities or quarantine that that might explain. First of all, Hitoshi, do you think that in part explains uh, why you've been able to do this quite successfully? And then David, uh, how generalizable do you think that is to other countries? And do you agree? So, yeah, we, we are also the implementing uh, the, the isolation and the quarantine measures. And uh, the particularly the, the we are doing the cluster based approach when we have a clusters the, we test the, the the most of people in that setting and then we can find the many the confirmed cases and we also ask the people the who were the at the that venue the, to be quarantined the for certain period of time and so the but the Initially, the, we isolated the all confirmed cases in hospital settings, and uh, hospitals are completely overwhelmed. And now, the we are uh, the some people are isolated in the designated the the facilities, the, such as hotels, and uh, some people are also the the some confirmed the cases can also be isolated at home. The, when they have the, if they have no family member, the, especially the no, the elderly at home, the, the people can choose the, to be isolated the, at home the, if they have a, the asymptomatic or the very mild symptoms. Yeah. Emma, maybe I would ask Hitoshi, is that mandatory or is it recommended? Is it volunteer, voluntary? And are they provided with resources, or do they have to pay for their isolation procedures? So the for isolation, the all costs are paid by the government, and it's uh, the, it's a mandatory. So they have the if the the you are confirmed as a the COVID nineteen, the you must be isolated. Mm -hmm. So you know, Emma, is that transferable to other countries? Well, certainly some of the aspects of that are many countries wouldn't be able to require people to isolate. But one of the deterrents of people isolating is the fact that 
many of them don't have the resources in which to, uh, to live during that period of time or the ability to get what they need. And so if government is providing this, it adds an added incentive to be able to self-isolate. And I know some countries are doing that. And that's more of a, uh, of, a, of a way of controlling outbreaks, whereas most countries do not provide that service at their borders. So if international people come in, they're required many times to isolate at their own expense, whereas people who are within countries often are isolated and the government is providing them with the means they need to continue to um, function and to, to live and getting them back to work as soon as possible. Now that there's testing available, which um, adds a new element to that, rapid diagnostic testing, some countries are beginning to test people during their quarantine period to see if after a period of five to seven days, they do have uh, contact or do have um, um, evidence of infection based on when their contact occurred. And if they're free of infection, then they're released from quarantine earlier. So there are new ways that we can deal with this, but clearly um, getting people who have been in contact isolated is the key to this, investigating outbreaks, shutting down transmission, and getting people into isolation to prevent forward transmission into the communities is just good basic control of an outbreak or a pandemic. And Japan has applied all of these in a very unusual and very effective manner so far. Um, I'm, I'm gonna move on to questions now. Um, <clears throat> and this is one um, from Caroline Johns. And it is um, off topic of this discussion, but very on topic for today. And that is um, to do with the, the UK's uh, regulatory approval of the Pfizer vaccine today and, and what your thoughts are on that. Um, and I guess how much of a game changer is this? How should we be thinking about the arrival of vaccine in our lives? Can we just kind of relax now? What, what does this mean for us? I know, David, you and I are going to be doing something further on this in, in the next uh, week or so, look more deeply. But um, why don't I start with Hitoshi? Um, what's, what are we to make of the news that the vaccines are starting to be rolled out? It feels really real now. What do we do with this? So we've been hearing some good news um, that regarding the effectiveness of vaccine, but uh, um, we are quite cautious uh, in the, the implementing a vaccine vaccination program in Japan. The, 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 the Japanese people are quite sensitive to any adverse event they associated with vaccines. And that's why that we uh, not, we cannot implement uh, the, the human papilloma vac the vaccination program in Japan the, due to the, the concern about uh, adverse event. And uh, so we have to be very careful and uh, the, we need also need more data uh, in terms of effectiveness and the safety. And uh, we are not sure the, the, how this vaccine is effective. The, in the especially the long term effectiveness the is not the 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 problem so and also the we are not sure the how the these newly developed vaccine are safe and uh, the so we have to be very the careful the in implementing the the is in starting the, any the vaccination program for COVID-19. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna do two questions at once now, just so we can fit more in. Um, one, okay, well, here's, here's two from Bill Emmett. Um, what measures have been brought in to protect care homes and other elderly facilities and what role has been played and when by restrictions on international travel? That's for you, Hitoshi. And then um, there was another one here. Uh, why don't we start? Oh, yes, John Mason. Will the prospect of the Olympics in Japan later in 2021 change the approach to COVID from what it might have been otherwise? Sorry, David, there's not one for you there. I'll try it next time. <laughs> 
Okay, so maybe I can I can start. The 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 nursing home the the it is uh, the the one of the most important aspect of COVID nineteen response. The, we saw many outbreaks in the nursing home and the hospitals in the the particularly in the March April May, and uh, so, but the, the now the the especially in the August September or the even in July June July we had a large number of cases in the June July but the majority of cases at that time the, were among young people but we also saw some the clusters in the, the nursing home and hospitals but the size of outbreak it was relatively small the the probably because uh, they implemented more proactive measures, the, including the proactive testing the, for any suspected cases. But the, the in current phase, the particularly this month, that we are also seeing some increasing trend of uh, the clusters in the nursing homes. Uh, and uh, that we, are, the, we need to implement more the, the measures the, to prevent the transmission to the such setting. The, the, as in European countries, we are also seeing the, the many deaths associated with a cluster uh, in a nursing home and hospital. And also in the hospitals, uh, the, as you know, we, are, we have uh, the highly aged population and the many hospitalized cases are elderly people with some underlying the medical conditions. So it's very, the critical to the, the, the prevent the transmission in these settings. And uh, the, we are the implementing more the aggressive measures uh, to prevent the transmission uh, into these settings. And uh, international travel, the, the government is the, of course the trying to the, the increase the, the, the international travel uh, due to the economic and other reasons. And, uh, but uh, again, we have to balance between the suppression of uh, the transmission and uh, the maintaining the social and economic activities, and uh, which is quite the different challenge. And um, that we are uh, doing uh, testing at the airport, and uh, we are seeing the, the, the many case, positive cases the every day at the airport. The, um, among pro passengers from other countries. So <clears throat> the, some of them, the, the, they may be negative at the airport, but uh, they might be infected. So the, there is a certain risk of uh, the, 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 the spread of the virus the, from the, the imported cases. So we have to the, the be again, they're very careful in opening our borders. And for the Olympic, um, the, the, again, the, toward the Olympic, the, the government is trying to the increase the, the international the travel uh, between Japan and other countries. And uh, so, but uh, again, we have to be careful uh, in opening uh, the, our border. And, uh, but, uh, the, the even without Olympic, the, we need to the, increase the, the international travel for the many reasons, and uh, so we have to. Uh, we are now uh, also discussing how uh, we can open our borders. Over to you. Okay, Th thank you for that. I I found a couple of questions, David. You could probably field. Um, here's here's two. One uh, for. Nahid, from uh, Nahida Porter Carrero. Um, thank you for the in interesting presentation. Um, you mentioned the nightlife as a focus point. Is there something specific to nightlife rather than, for example, daytime working that facilitates the spread, for example, kissing? David, I'm sure you could answer that one. Um, <laughs> and then for Hitoshi, this is from uh, Pratik Shaya Acharya. Sorry if I've mangled that. 
Um, do you carry out retrospective contact tracing for each case identified? If not, how do you decide or prioritize the case for ret retrospective, retrospective contact tracing? David, do you want to answer yours first? Yeah, and then well, also for yeah. Hitoshi, sorry, Martin Brobau, just a quick one. Have schools and universities remained open and have they played any major role in cluster generation? So David, on the uh, anything specific to nightlife rather than daytime. Well, you know, virus transmits wherever there's people in close proximity and infected people who are able to transfer the virus to others. So in workplaces, very importantly, they've taken measures to make sure that people stay physically distanced. And people in most workplaces now are given the opportunity to remain physically distanced, either by staying home or going into offices where there is, or other areas of work where there is space uh, between people, except in certain industries which have had problems such as food processing factories. So there, there, there are no secrets about why nightlife transmits because people are in close proximity. Many times they're not physically distanced and they're not wearing masks. And by not doing that, they're infecting others. And, you know, in certain areas where there's alcohol consumption, people sometimes let down their guard. And if they were trying to physically distance, they end up not being able to physically distance because their judgment is impaired. So that's why government has a role to play in making sure that the guidelines that they provide are followed if they're opening up these areas where, where work does occur. And, they, and it's the responsibility of those places as well to maintain physical distancing possibilities so that people don't get infected. And it's especially important over Christmas. What's important now is that people who are intending to go visit parents or grandparents, if they've been in one of these closed situations during the five to seven days before they're going to spend time with their families, they should realize that they could create a risk and could infect family members. And nobody wants to really do that. So it takes responsibility and responsible thinking by us all as we prepare for getting together with families. But Hitoshi will be able to give a lot more information on, on that and on other issues as well. Hitoshi, do you remember the questions or do you need me to repeat those others? Yeah. The, before answering uh, the other questions, uh, the, let me add to what the, the, the David mentioned about uh, the night life setting. Uh, the, we analyze many clusters and uh, we identify the common characteristics the, 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 for the clusters. The, and uh, these common characteristics the, in which uh, the most of clusters the, are, have been occurring, they include uh, the closed environment, as David mentioned, the closed environment is quite important. The, most of clusters uh, have been occurring in an indoor setting, in a closed environment with poor ventilation. Then the, and also crowded condition. The, the, to have uh, the cluster with many people, the, there must be the many people at that venue. So the crowded condition is quite important. And also the close contact settings the, by talking, uh, especially talking the, without the mask and uh, with loud voice. The, so the, in nightlife settings, the, the most of the nightlife settings, the, these the, the three conditions, the, we call it as uh, three Cs or some meets in Japanese. And um, the, so that's probably why the, we are seeing the many clusters the, in the nightlife settings. And um, the, actually, the, we are using the, this three C's concept the, to disseminate the, our public health message to the, the general public. And uh, the even small kids in Japan know this concept. And uh, yesterday, the, 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 the buzzword of the year was announced. And uh, they identified the Sanmitsu or three C's uh, as a, the buzzword of the year. So it's very popular, the word now in Japan. And uh, so it's, it's quite important public health message uh, to avoid such settings. And uh, regarding uh, the, the prioritization of retrospective contact tracing, and uh, it's, it's quite important issue 
And uh, the retrospective contact tracing is quite time consuming and labor intensive. And the public health nurses are spending uh, the sometimes more than an hour to interview one the, the infected person. And uh, the, we've been they trying to interview the all cases, but uh, the, in places where the large number of cases are occurring, the, at the moment we are seeing the, the many cases in Tokyo, Osaka, and uh, Sapporo in the northern part of Japan. And in these the places, uh, it's quite, it's not feasible to do the, the detailed interview for each one of the cases. And uh, in such situation, we have to prioritize. And um, the, particularly the, we are asking the, 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 we are doing more intensive interview the, to the, the infected person who are possibly associated with large clusters, like uh, nightlife settings, or and also the possibly associated with uh, the, the 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 nursing homes or the hospitals, and uh, we are uh, the we need to prioritize in uh, such setting, and we also need to the suppress the transmission the, by implementing more uh, physical contact measures. The uh, in the situation where the, the we are seeing the large number of cases, so that the, we can start the restart the our cluster-based approach in these settings. Over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm going to go with the the most upvoted question um, at the moment. Well, actually, the two most upvoted questions. Um, so one is definitely for Hitoshi, but David, you're, you're free to speak to it if you want. And I think it's, I think it's uh, directed at Hitoshi from Gareth Watson. And it is, what is your take on the UK's COVID-19 strategy and rollout? Greatly appreciate your time. That's, that's one. And the second question is from Adam uh, Matajovic. And this again is a little bit more on the, the cluster busting saying, um, it occurs to me that cluster busting method is efficient up to a certain number of infections. What might be the critical limit of this approach, e.g. certain percentage of, a, of epidemiologically unlinked cases or the exhausted number of personnel of contact tracing? Um, I guess the question is, does there come a point where there is a limit to this approach? And if it's not feasible any longer, what would the plan B be? So those seem to be um, at least the first one. Uh, Hitoshi, do you want to start? So I'm not so familiar with the UK approach, but uh, the 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 in I understand in UK you have a large number of cases every day, and uh, so the and also the lockdown type of measures the the have a many negative impact. And uh, the, we've been trying to avoid the, such measure to be implemented. And, uh, and so the early intervention or early response to the increasing number of cases is quite important to avoid the lockdown. And uh, the, so far, we managed to avoid such the situation. And, uh, the, we are now, as I mentioned, we are now seeing the increasing trend of uh, the cases, but uh, the level of uh, the, the transmission uh, is probably uh, much less than the, the level of transmission in the September or so in UK. And so the, we are trying to implement the early intervention uh, so that the uh, that we can avoid the lockdown or the, some more the aggressive measures. Then now our goal is the, the not to the declared state of emergency the under current situation. And for the retrospective contact tracing, the limit of retrospective contact tracing, as I mentioned, uh, it's um, that we are now facing to this kind of situation and uh, it's the not feasible 
to interview the every cases the under current situation. The, we we it's still possible in some the the smaller cities and uh, actually the in most of places in Japan it's still possible. But uh, the some metropolitan areas, uh, Tokyo, Osaka, and the Sapporo in the northern part of Japan, the uh, it's getting the not feasible to the do the proper the the, the contact tracing, including the retrospective ones. In such settings, it's important to the slow down the transmission, and by implementing more the physical distancing measures, the we are now the asking the some restaurants about to be closed the area, and also that we are asking the people to stay at home the as much as possible in some places, and uh, so these measures need to be implemented to slow down the transmission uh, before the starting our proper the contact tracing. So, so David, I, I wanted to ask you if yeah, maybe it, as far as vis-a-vis um, -vis the UK's COVID-19 strategy and rollout, what aspects of the Japan model do you think the UK could, could benefit from? And something I haven't had time to bring up was the, uh, the, the wisdom of mass testing approach. Hitoshi, you in Japan have not gone for trying to test everybody, test, test, test. You've been very strategic with your testing. I've kind of held on to that because that's the subject of our next uh, webinar next week on uh, strategic use of tests. But, but David, maybe you could uh, talk about what aspects of, of uh, the Japan model that the UK uh, strategy and rollout could borrow from. It's a slight, slightly different question, but I just want to move it on since that's our last question. I've got two minutes left. Yeah, Please. well, you know, and I'd like to thank Itoshi because what he's presented to us is best practice in public health. Japan has done most things right as far as the public health situation is concerned. They've done an epidemiological approach to outbreak containment. What's happened in the UK is that they began with identifying, identifying and working with clusters and doing contact tracing, but then they felt overwhelmed when hospitals were threatened and there were the blunt lockdowns. That doesn't mean that there still aren't clusters occurring in the UK that could be addressed the way that Japan addresses them. In fact, there are many, especially in rural areas. The urban areas, some of them have had, um, just like in Japan, will have to close down certain areas and maintain those closed down, or at least have great caution occurring in those areas moving forward. Whereas there is an opportunity to prevent areas where clusters are occurring from spreading into communities. And that's where concentration has to be done, especially for contact tracing. And I think if, uh, what Hitoshi said earlier was very important, that this is done by the local public health system, not by the national system. So the public health nurses who have been working in these areas for their entire careers have the trust of the people, have the confidence, and are the best contact tracers, both forward and backward. And so it's not too late for the United Kingdom to adopt many of these policies. And there will be an advantage now because there are vaccines as well, which will certainly prevent mortality in the elderly and in those persons at greatest risk. So there are a whole new opportunities in the United Kingdom now and in other countries to really move ahead in a way that we can recapture some of the errors or the mistakes that have been made, made in the past to really move ahead stopping transmission in communities and in clusters and trying to emulate the best practice that's occurred in Japan and in many other countries in the Asian setting. Okay, but thank the, you. But so Emma, at, yeah, at, the yes, bottom, yes. at the bottom of all this though has to be a willingness of the population to cooperate and to work in solidarity as has occurred in Japan. Yeah, that, that certainly seems, seems true. Um, that, that is all we have time for today. And hopefully we got through a few more questions uh, than last time. Um, of course, we'll be back next week and that'll be um, to talk about uh, strategic use of diagnostic tests, um, uh, all these new tests we have at our disposal. Um, Hitoshi, thank you so much for giving us your time and your insight today and so many things we could all learn from the experience in Japan. 
It's been a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda David. And thank, you, uh, thank you all for tuning in. And as I said at the beginning, if you wanted, there's so many juicy details in here. If you wanted to go back to them, um, if you go to the Chatham House YouTube uh, channel, there's a special playlist with the whole archive of all our webinars. And this should be on there um, later on today, almost immediately. So anyway, thank you all for tuning in. And thank you, Hitoshi. And thank you, David, as ever. And uh, David, I'll see you next week. And Hitoshi, have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.